Welcome to the D3 10th anniversary celebration. I'm really excited for everyone to be here and we'll get started. We do have um, quite a, a fun lineup today. Some, you know, looking back, some looking forward. I'm very excited uh, for the speakers. And, um, and there's also a, uh, we'll have a, a question and answer at the end of this. It is exactly 10 years since D3 version one was released to the world. It has been an amazing 10 years. Um, we're gonna look, take a look at, at what's happened. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit what we hope to see from the next 10 years. We have um, members of the community presenting work. Uh, Mike Bostock's gonna say some words and then we'll do the question and answer. So I'll shout out one more time to the little Q&A tool in Crowdcast and we'll go through that at the end of the event. So first of all, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ian Johnson. Uh, you may see me online as Angelot. And I've been helping organize events around D3 for the last eight out of the 10 years uh, since I started learning, uh, started meeting, meeting folks first on the uh, mailing list and then um, meeting in person in San Francisco. And now we're doing these online virtual events uh, so we get to, um, you know, meet people from from all over the world. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's my honor to to say happy birthday to D three. Um, it's you know, it's really cool, amazing library, a really amazing community, and and we're here to celebrate both of those. One of the way uh, ways I we, we want to celebrate is that we actually put together a little a video from um, members of the community. So I'd like to play that real quick, two minutes, and then we'll be right back. I, I'm so, it's, it's, sometimes I think like if it wasn't for D3, where would my life even, even be? What career would I have right now? And I think that's so amazing that, and I'm not the only one that has that. And it's, it's, I think it's so amazing that this, this one sort of tool library I don't even know quite know what to call it, um, it how it has affected so many people's lives I think that I think that's that's quite an achievement and I'm really happy for it and uh, the other reason I love d3 is because of the developer community uh, it's just an invaluable you know source of inspiration and information with uh, unbelievably talented members and also helpful members I learned so much from the B3 community. I love the help channel. Uh, I think that the community that's there is great. I'm glad that we can come together and be able to help people from all skill levels. I, you know, I joined and I lurked for a long time while I was still learning B3, and now I try and, and help. Bonjour, je m'appelle Christophe Vio. Hi, you're Willem Dool. Hey, I'm Adam. My name is Mike Freeman. My name's Rachel Binks. Hi, I'm Tom Tucker. Hello. I'm Curran. I'm Ian Johnson. My name is Jeffrey Hare. I'm Amelia Wattenberger. Hi, I'm Philippe Riviera. My name is Tony Chu. My name is Maya Gans. Hey, my name is Bill Morris. Hey, uh, my name is Bo Erickson. My name is John Alexis Guerra Gomez. Hi, my name is Shirley Wu. Hey there, this is Molly Pettit here. I, as well as many people in the data's viz field, had a circuitous journey to get where I'm at. And then it was working as a data scientist that I encountered data visualization and specifically D3, and I thought it was just awesome. Because it uh, essentially externalizes cognition. It lets you think about the world in a totally data-driven way that's grounded in reality. And D3 is just this wonderful expanse of possible ways to visualize data. The ability to draw with data is just so fantastic. So thank you and uh, happy 10th birthday, D3. All right. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lovely video. Um, thank you to all the, the folks who, who sent in their testimonials. Um, we'll be publishing that and, uh, you know, tweeting it out, putting it on YouTube. And then I think, you know, we're gonna try to make a, a longer longer form to, to really get into to all the, the nice things that um, people have shared. 
So, um, yeah, thank you. And with, uh, with that, I'd like to, to start um, with our first talk. First up, I'd like to, to welcome Christoph Yao, who is a um, longtime member of the D3 community. Um, we first met when the, the SFD3 meetup initially got started. It was just an email on the mailing list uh, almost, I think, nine years ago. And uh, Christoph helped kick, kick off that meetup and has been an active member of the community online as well. The super um, amazing uh, galleries of examples, the, the D3 visualization Twitter account, and now helping organize um, even more efforts. So Christoph, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, so as you all know, like D3 is all about the community. So so a few months ago, we we decided to meet and try to like discuss like, what do we want to do to facilitate that community. Um, personally, I wanted to make a timeline of D3 events, like all of these 10 years, like what did we do? Like, how did we grow that community and, and how can it still grow? Um, but then we figured like, we need a website. We need like some communication channels. We need a place to come together. So let me show you what we worked on. And that is all just for you, like for us, for the community. Okay, so we have a new website. Uh, as you all know, like we, there's the d3js.org website, which will stay there. Like that's more like around D3, how to learn it. But now we wanted to have one for the community. So we'll have blog posts, uh, we have a newsletter. Uh, so you can subscribe, you, you can just go to d3js.community and that's where the new website is. Um, from there, you can subscribe to the newsletter. For example, like you just, as usual, and we will keep a, an archive of, of all like the, the thing we will share. What we want to share is more than just what, what D3 is doing, because D3 is also like the data viz, like we just want to kind of expand the community. Like you can see that this is just some, some stuff that, that we found during the months of uh, January. So, this is the current kickoff event for the celebration. Uh, uh, Outlier conference and like a lot of content like this. So all of this will have an archive here on the website. Um, we have an uh, in the uh, community leads page. Like that's just a way to say like that some people wanted to get together and like work on these tools and so, and feel free to join. Uh, you can just reach out to us on Slack. We have a Gmail too. So we really don't want this to be like a like a closed circle. Like that, that's just a way to, to expand the community. Okay, and then we have some special pages um, that are just made for this current event. Let me show you what I wanted to work on with a, with a team of people. It's a D3 timeline. So what is this? Um, I wanted to show that like in this, these 10 years, there's kind of an, there's an evolution that happened, but there, there was a way to grow the community. And I think it was really because it's a tool that people needed. And also because from the start, it had communication channels. It had like ways to share. It was like, it's, it's an open source project. Uh, and there are multiple ways to uh, contribute. So this is on CodePen, so you can fork it, you can like modify it. All the, the data is on a spreadsheet, so I, I could make a form and then you could like submit. What was your milestones? Like what were the times where we say, you said, okay, like D3, I really need to try that. So this is just like a first like, like dump of the milestones that we think are very, valuable and and that may be very personal okay i made a tiny like floating bubble chart you can click on them to like scroll directly to where you want to go um and and i just want to highlight some of them um for example there was a prehistory 
there was a time before D3. Uh, 10 years is, is a long time, but like in 2015, we were using Prefuse and Flare and projects by, by uh, Jeffrey here that were like before D3. Uh, I know that I remember like, uh, so like 2007, uh, I was struggling to play with uh, 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 SVG. So, uh, so I was using this tool and that's, that's my personal context where then I discovered D3 and it helped me like with it, like it, a bunch of tools to help me work with uh, uh, HTML5. I was using like Raphael JS because at the time uh, Internet Explorer was using like VML and so so like it was we needed like a lot of shims like this. Then there was Protovis. Protovis was more a way to like a low level um, charting library, but just like the the uh, the building blocks for the chart library. But then D3 was launched. So D3 v1 10 years ago. But at the very start, there was like Google Groups and Wikis. And um, so I think it was very natural for people to jump on it and then write uh, uh, tutorials. Like the first one I can think of is, was like D3 for me immortals in 2011. But then there was like this whole series of uh, uh, examples to that were very uh, uh, impressing. Like it was the first time, at least for me, that I can see like all of the various things that you can do just with like low level building blocks. Then of course the website and then, yeah, like a series of keynotes and, and a series of um, uh, examples with like less typical charts, like this core diagram. One that I want to highlight is I really got started with these tutorials. Uh, a line left. So you can see it on the Wayback Machine. Uh, and then when you look at it right now, like you can see that a line left is in fact Scott Murray and, it's, uh, and it has a book. And this book is still my, my favorite, like at least to get started. So by this, I want to show that like this thing was there like in 2012 and then it turned into a book and it got like many uh, uh, updates and it's still in use. Um, one thing that I personally like is like when I saw like the first plugins, I saw ways where D3 is not just the D3 core, like it's not just building blocks. It has like multiple layers of kind of an abstraction that you can build on top and that you can share too. You, you can build charts, but you can also build plugins. Um, you can like just like dissect what, what, what the New York Times is doing, uh, uh, for example, and try to kind of explain like how. Uh, how to get there, you can use like some some patterns to build charts. Um, but then there's also like, um, yeah, so all of the way to to meet. So Jan mentioned the 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 uh, D3 meetup, for example, this D3 meetup was kind of an overflow meetup with people that were not able to get to that D3 workshop here at, at uh, 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 Visual Lee. So like a few blocks away, we just met in a, in a cafe and that's how it started. And now it has like, it has, it has like a big uh, community around it. And then this community around the, the barrier D3 meetup um, made the D3 Unconf um, here and like multiple years of it. So you can see like, just like planting some seeds, like we started just like, like a few people in a cafe and then like it became something bigger. And, and of course that's not just us, like there are like these meetups like all, uh, all around the world. The last kind of like spark I want to, to talk about is uh, uh, inventing on principle. That's a thing that, that really like struck me as kind of a game changer. It was a talk by, by Brett Victor to kind of like take control over your, your, not just your data, but like an experience. You should be able to shape your, your world. So like, it's not just about life coding it. And it's not just about database. It's about like an experience that, that you own and that you can like uh, uh, collaborate on. And this led the way to tributary by Ian, and then to um, 
later to the blood builder. So the Kickstarter was like in 2015. And I'm mentioning it because like this on top of like blocks, which is a way to share uh, code snippets and uh, live uh, 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 examples. All of this was there from the start. By the way, that's why you, you can see here, like you have an array chart, the blue one, and it's the number of, of um, blocks that were created and that you can see in the block builder gallery. You can see that like, that's a huge curve here. Um, and, and by the way, this is like the search for D3.js on, uh, on uh, Google search. So you can see that like it started here and then there was really like a big, a, 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 a big curve. And that's how I would summarize it is, is like we have here in the IOTAC for example, where Mike was really showing like how much sharing example was the core for that community. That's all I wanted to share for this. So um, this, if you want to add some stuff that you think like are really like milestones, um, just reach out to us on Slack. So Ian will continue uh, talking about, I think a bit more of like how we want to like help shape the community. Uh, we have these events, we have like these blog posts, we have these newsletters, we have these like specific uh, projects. We will talk about the, the D3 parade. So back to you, Jan. All right. Thanks, Christoph. That was great. So yeah, before we, we get into um, sharing more of those, um, these efforts, I want to take a little bit of time uh, to reflect as well as um, talk about like how and why um, we're coming together in this uh, kind of new way. So yeah, I mean, as, as Christoph showed, right, like, you know, 10 years, a lot happens. Uh, a lot of people have contributed a whole lot of things, right, uh, from all the knowledge sharing and um, all the, the examples, the questions people ask, and then the answers people give. Uh, just some stats that I've, I've been looking at is like, all right, so, you know, D3 has 30 modules, it used to be one repo, I heard the feedback that um, people wanted it more to break it apart and use the, the different tools. Uh, those 30 modules together have about a thousand API um, functions, right? And to cover those, of course, there's really uh, detailed and great documentation and hundreds of official examples, but there's also more than 40,000 blocks that people have made over the years. And now, you know, many th thousands of uh, observable notebooks and, and other, you know, I mean, the tutorials, the books, um, we have, yeah, I'm sure there's hundreds of tutorials, dozens of books, lots of Stack Overflow, um, and uh, and a lot of events now, right? And we have meetups in, in a lot of major cities. Now we're trying to do these online uh, events, pe bring people together across the world. Um, so, you know, in from my perspective, what I've what I've always seen in the D3 community is that it's it's very organic. Like people come from a lot of different backgrounds, whether it's like programmers and engineers or data analytic, data analysts or scientists, uh, designers, uh, people you know, trying to communicate or understand data. Um, we get uh, people from, from all over the place and um, then they end up making all kinds of different things, right? Like all these blocks that we see, all the amazing visualizations whether it's like on the front page of New York Times or somebody's um, blog post, like the perspectives we get to see are so varied and so rich. And that's what I, I really love uh, being part of the community is just because you see so, so much happening. But the thing is, right, with all that happening, it can be really easy to, um, to miss stuff. It can be easy uh, or it can be hard to find the thing that you saw go by a couple months ago and you're like, oh, I really wanted to, to do that. And, you know, and the a person was nice enough to write up their experience, share their process, share their work. Um, and there's so many places you can go to ask questions. There's so many places you can go to find examples. Um, we, you know, 
for a while we've kind of felt this, um, you know, this, this jungle of, of resources and it's, it can be hard to find what you're looking for. So we decided that, um, to ask several members of the community who have been contributing in these different ways um, for so long to come together and, and help us uh, kind of organize, right? Like put together, put our heads together and figure out what would make uh, the community a better place. What would make it easier for people to either find help or get their work out there or connect with each other. And, and, and so, we, we put together this group and I want to um, introduce them because I, I think that you'll probably know most of them in, in some way uh, if you have, you know, been on online learning D3 and, and uh, looking at these things over the past 10 years. So I like, let me first just go through who these folks are, say a few nice words uh, about each one, and and then I'll talk a little bit more about um, how we're hoping we'll, we'll work together and with the community. Um, yeah, so you've already met Christoph. Uh, he just gave us this nice talk, and I, I mentioned has been contributing to the community for, for many years, uh, organizing, collecting, and sharing resources, making tutorials. Um, so thank you, Chris. Um, for everything you've done. Uh, Philippe, um, you may know him as Phil on, <laughs> on the um, GitHub or uh, chats. Or, um, and he, Phil has contributed a lot to uh, the library and the examples um, recently. So, and, and for a while now, I've been an active member of the community. Uh, you probably know his awesome like projections and mapping work. Um, but he, he did a lot for V6 uh, as well recently. So thank you, Phil. Shirley uh, Wu, you will hear from her shortly. Um, and you've probably seen some of the amazing uh, visualizations she's done. Uh, recently published a, a book with, uh, with Nadi Bremer uh, called Data Sketches. So you should go go get your copy. Um, it's amazing, inspiring, and it comes from the Data Sketches project, which was a huge gift to the community. I mean, showing your whole process uh, start to finish for so many amazing visualizations. Uh, Molly Pettit, who you heard from in, in the video just now, and um, amazing organizer, uh, most recently behind the Outlier Conference. I'm sure many of you attended. Um, it was a really cool event. Um, I mean, above and beyond what, what one would imagine from an online conference, really, really inspiring several days. Um, so really excited to have, have Molly uh, guide us um, in, in the community efforts. Sebastian uh, Gutierrez, uh, you probably know him better as Dashing D3JS, a longtime creator of tutorials, uh, workshops, and um, and resources online. He also helped start the, the New York D3 meetup, which grew to several thousand members. Um, so really glad to have Sebastian's uh, help with the community. Amelia Wattenberger. Uh, many people have been uh, learning D3 from her in her uh, full stack D3 and data viz book as well as uh, the accompanying online course and her, I mean, beautiful blog posts, uh, really inspiring um, tutorials and, and um, guides. So really fortunate to have Amelia um, giving to the community. Adam Pierce, uh, a longtime uh, D3 practitioner um, and maker of, of great plugins. Um, Adam's like a, you know, fantastic, like perspective on on data visualization and pushes you know pushes D three forward. Really happy to have him uh, with us. Curran Kelleher, uh, you may have seen, you know, may have seen him on YouTube <laughs> or um, used one of the examples that he so helpfully put together on VizHub. 
I often find them in the, the help Slack. Um, so, you know, Curran is, has been a long time member of the community, always super, uh, patient and, and helpful. So thank you, Curran, for, um, what you do for the community. Nadi Bremer, uh, again, uh, Shirley's partner in crime in the, the data sketches project and book. Um, you've seen her visualizations out there, uh, guaranteed. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're just really happy that, that she's um, uh, helping, helping steer the community in the right way. Her tutorials have taught like some amazing things uh, to, to many, many people. Um, kind of weird to introduce myself, but uh, yeah, I've been, been organizing meetups and, and making tutorials and um, uh, try, you know, just trying to help for, for a long time because D3 gives me a lot and, and I'm really, Actually, and I learn a lot when, when I help people, as, as I'm sure many of you find as well. So it's um, really happy to, to be able to work with, with all these amazing folks. And last but certainly not least is uh, Simon Colleen, who is um, an organizer. He, he started the D3 Oakland meetup and has been an active organizer of the unconferences over the years, uh, really um, value that the energy and perspective that CMOP brings um, when we're, we're working together. So yeah, that is the community leads. Um, I do want to <laughs> want to say that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get together the, these folks to, to evaluate and, and look at what, like what the community has, like what all is out there? Can we catalog it? Can we categorize it? Can we somehow design better ways to um, to dis display it? Uh, some of the things that Christoph already mentioned, right? Is like first of all, we're, we're making a new website where we can um, easily surface uh, community-driven uh, things, um, and, and you know, related to that is the newsletter Christoph mentioned. Uh, the feedback we've heard from a lot of people is that you know it's hard to keep up with like the various tweets or chats and everything. You know, it's the time things just go by and and you may miss out on um, something you really cared about. So we're going to work together to like curate and and um, aggregate important news and things that you know we think people will be interested on a monthly basis. And um, we're going to work together to coordinate more online events, especially while we're, we're all, you know, stuck at home and it's harder to get in person. Um, and maybe in the future when we, when we do start having in-person events, um, we can uh, help, you know, help each other coordinate and, and broadcast and that kind of good stuff. Um, yeah, and, and we can uh, help people start new, um, new meetups like, uh, and I see in the chat talking about a Spanish D3 meetup. We can certainly um, share share expertise in, in hosting and, and um, organizing those things. And I think that that's the kind of thing that would be great to see more, right? There's um, people from all over the world who can, can reach each other and, and share and collaborate. Uh, we're, I won't say too much about it because Shirley and Simon are going to introduce this concept to the, the D3 parade, which I'm really excited uh, to see, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, but that's, you know, there's a, a sort of working group that they're leading to, to make that happen. And, and maybe in the future we can do uh, more things like that. Um, yeah, and actually great, great points in the chat. If, if you do want to organize um, online meetups, like we did start this new D3 online Thing to capture that so we could you know if we want to do a Spanish meetup and host it there and, and reach anybody who might be interested uh, we can uh, we have a more like central ways of uh, getting the word out and getting people together and kind of speaking of that one of the things that we really want to do and, and we actually you know we're going to need the input and the help of the whole community to make this happen but it you know we can start the ball rolling with with this group is improving the communication channels um, and I see that there's a question just exactly around this. So like there's, there's many different ways to get in touch with each other and 
they've some have like grown up organically over the years. Some are like more active, used to be more active and are less active now. So we want to try to um, make that easier to understand. So yeah, like right now, the Slack is probably the the quickest way to to just get in contact with any of the you know the organizers or the the rest of the community. There's thousands and thousands of people on there, um, but um, we you know we want to look through all of the 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 options and um, design a better environment. So we don't we haven't been able to do that. We need input from everybody. Um, but that's definitely the kind of thing we want to do. We want to do things like make a, a code of conduct that we can use across our online um, presences, like whether it's in the chats or the GitHubs or the um, the various places people get together. Because you know this community is is a very humble and very welcoming community in general. Um, we have you know I see hundreds of people asking questions and there's no such thing as a stupid question and people are very kind and patient and people share their work and they get constructive feedback. And that's, it's just a really pleasant community to be a part of. And that's something that we want to keep going. Right. And as, as it continues to grow, as more and more people continue to learn D3, we just want to make sure that uh, we carry that culture forward, something that has been really valuable and, and something we can, um, you know, we do have to maintain. And, uh, sort of on, on this similar um, thread, the idea that there's many places to to ask for help or share work, um, and some of them are transient. Like you can ask a question and get an answer, and then no one else will be able to benefit from that in the future because it's not stored in the history. Or some of them are in places where it is stored, like Stack Overflow, but people don't necessarily know to look there. So we want to do um, a better job like working together to, to help people even like know what to ask know where to ask it know if it's been asked before that kind of stuff so that, that's it takes work it takes coordinated effort to um make these kinds of improvements and i'm really happy that the the leads that we've got together so far want to um help you know get together and and figure that out and yeah if you're interested in in helping with any of these efforts um definitely get in touch. I would say that the Slack is currently the best way to do that. And, uh, you know, sign up for the newsletter. There is a, a on the D3 website, the D3 community website, there's a, a new email we're going to try to um, take in, you know, people who want to volunteer. Uh, so, so yeah, get in touch that way. So um, that is what I wanted to say. I'm very very happy um, with this group. I'm really excited with what we're, you know, what we should be able to do in the next 10 years. I definitely hope to be using D3 still for 10 years from now. Um, and, you know, who knows how, uh, how much more, uh, how much cooler it will be by then. So with that, I would like to introduce somebody who probably needs no introduction. The one thing I do want to say, though, is that uh, this person, you know, you know a lot of what he's done, you know, um, I know we all want to say a uh, heartfelt thank you. And, um, but I do just want to say, like, you know, Mike's infinite seeming uh, patience and kindness and thoughtfulness in leading um, this project, this community, uh, it's really an honor to say uh, happy birthday to, to D3. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can you all hear me okay? Uh, I'm a little discombobulated right now um, because I woke up this morning, uh, you know, 6 a.m. thinking I would get, you know, some, some good time in to prepare what I was going to say, only to discover that my internet was out. So I spent a couple hours trying to get my internet working, eventually gave up, decided to go to my parents' house and mooch on their Wi-Fi. Uh, and I brought my laptop, and then I booted up my laptop, only to discover that the keyboard on my laptop is broken. Um, so I am now on my mom's laptop, sitting outside my parents' house um, in the cold, which is why I'm wearing a hat. And it's not that cold here. Fortunately, we're not in the polar vortex. vortex. 
um, but it's a little cold here. Um, and also there's some construction going on and trucks coming by. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not here a hundred percent today, but I am still super excited, um, to be here at this kickoff, you know, and to see this like new, uh, iteration of the D3 community. And I'm really excited uh, and honored that you all came here to help celebrate that, uh, with us. Um, so I thought I would, um, try to give a few kind of reflections of things that I've learned over the last 10 years. Um, and I don't think this is in any way comprehensive. You know, I I'm not trying to overthink this. I think if I were to come up with 10 lessons learned again from scratch, I would probably come up with a different set. Um, but anyway, that's what I'm going to try to do. Hopefully something will be interesting to y'all. Um, and I thought I would start with a sort of a random factoid. I don't know if anybody knows this because um, I haven't really shared it, but the original name for D3 was actually Epheme, which is a contraction of ephemeral, uh, which was a reference to how selections in D3 were transient. You know, you would select some elements, you would manipulate them, and then you would kind of throw away the selection. You didn't have to persist it. It wasn't like most other tools where you had this scene graph that you would manipulate. And so I find it funny that, you know, 10 years later, this thing that was initially named after something that was transient and ephemeral is still so central to what I do every day and is still thriving and growing uh, and evolving. Um, all right, so here are my sort of 10 random lessons that I am going to share with you. And, and the first one I think hopefully is no surprise, uh, which is the sort of awesome power of documentation and, uh, you know, specifically, examples. I, I think when I, you know, started D3, I was already in, in the view that documentation was very important, but sort of seeing how important the, the, the examples and documentation have been to D3's success has only sort of redoubled and, and re-solidified that belief. Um, I think, you know, when you're a tool builder, it's easy to kind of get sucked into the, the tool itself and thinking about kind of features and bugs and, you know, functionality. Um, and you also can really internalize so much about how this tool works that, you know, a tool can be, you know, obvious and familiar, uh, you know, self-evident to you as the tool builder. Um, but, you know, for, for anyone else, it, it can be absolutely foreign. Um, so I think, you know, if your goal as a tool builder is to create something that people will use, right, like to have a practical impact and you're, you're not just doing it because it's fun or interesting. And that's a totally valid reason too. But, you know, if, if you want to create something that you, you think people will really, will really use, you know, you have to think about documentation. You have to think about teaching as kind of a central part of your strategy. Because, you know, in that sense, a tool is only as good as people understand it, right? As, as they're able to internalize it themselves. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in that. I think that's also helped to, you know, inform what we're doing with Observable by putting that kind of front and center. And so I hope for, for any of you that are also building tools that you sort of, you think about documentation as a central part of your strategy as well. Um, now, one thing I would also say is that in some sense, documentation and examples are almost too powerful in the sense that they can you know, kind of compensate for some of the flaws that you might have in your design or designs that are hard to use. Uh, you know, I'm looking at you, D3 stack, um, right? So people can, um, I think, develop an almost excessive reliance on the examples where they're, you know, they, they don't necessarily become fluent in the API and they sort of rely on the examples as their starting point. And, you know, clearly that's, that's a fine working strategy too. You know, you do what you got to do to be productive. But I think for me as a, as a tool builder, the other thing that I'm looking for is are people able to, you know, become fluent in the API as well? Can they internalize it? And can they sort of create things from scratch and, and original works as well and sort of not become overly dependent on the example? So those things kind of work together. Um, and there's another aspect of it as well, which is sort of how examples influence the design. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Um, okay, so the second thing I want to mention, I think this might be a little bit controversial or maybe surprising um, coming from me, but I think people overvalue interaction and animation. Um, you know, the kind of the bells and whistles, the, uh, the whiz bang stuff um, in, in visualization. Um, I think part of the reason for this is that these tools are, you know, they're impressive and they're novel and they're exciting. 
and sometimes you know that people are, are, get excited about them and they want to incorporate that into their own visualizations. Um, but the other aspect of it is that they are often hard to get working. And that means it's very easy for them to be distracting, right? You get excited about this feature, like incorporating, you know, zoom into your scatter plot, and it can potentially distract you from what the real purpose of your visualization should be, which is to either sort of discover something for yourself or to communicate some insight to somebody else. So I worry sometimes about people kind of getting distracted by these, the technical aspects of getting these features work, working and therefore losing sight of sort of the, the purpose of visualization, um, you know, which is insight, right? Either finding it for yourself or communicating that. And, you know, please don't take this as a moral judgment. You know, I certainly like uh, make this mistake myself sometimes, you know, even more than other people probably, because I think a lot about how these features are implemented. Um, but I think it's it's still good to say because I think you should look out for it in your own work as well. You know, it's like, am I really trying to, or is this work that I'm doing really helping me communicate or is it helping me discover something, you know, or am I just kind of excited about this technical was bangery, um, you know, and I think that that's also thinking about it from a, you know, user centric design perspective, right? Thinking about what the impact of your visualization is. Um, now, I think this also ties into examples a little bit because remember that um, examples are not always representative of real world visualizations. A lot of examples are pedagogical devices, right? They serve to teach a particular technique, either how to do it or what it's good for or what it's, what it's uh, used for. And so, you know, if you get excited about a particular technique that you see in, a, in an example, it's not necessarily, I mean, it, I, I hope that it is and I would try to make it so if, if it's possible, but it's not always a great illustration of um, you know, a good application of that technique. Sometimes it's just sort of a technical show and tell kind of thing rather than a, like, this is how you would actually put this into practice. Like sometimes that context I think is missing um, from the examples. Now, I think if you're interested in this topic, I would really recommend that you read Gregor Aisha's post from a few years ago, which is in defense of interactive graphics, um, mm -hmm. because I think that gives sort of more detail on, on when interaction and animation is useful. I do think that it is useful in many different contexts and that, that it is valuable. This is merely more of a statement of how I see it put into practice and sort of how it has drawbacks associated with it as well. Um, it's not just sort of a strictly net positive that you can add to any visualization and make it better. And I think that it's also a good practice to kind of start from the static design of a visualization because it really forces you to think about what you're trying to communicate what's important, uh, you know, particularly if you're doing explanatory visualizations. If you're doing more exploratory stuff, then absolutely, like, interaction is great for you to discover what's interesting more quickly in your visualization. But for a lot of us that are also doing explanatory graphics, you know, I think keep a wary eye on, on what the value is that, that interaction and animation are providing. Okay, so related to that, number three, and I, <laughs> I'm, like, run out of power here. Okay, I'm going to have to plug in later, maybe, but we'll see. Um, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? Okay, so yeah, in most cases, I think... Seem to be frozen. <laughs> this chat is so, so much fun. Y'all are the best. Um, I'm going to see if... Oh, plugging in, reconnecting. And Hello. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> so I swear this laptop was fully charged when I started, but for some reason I think this is just like too much work for it. So it <laughs> turned itself off. So add that to the list of technical difficulties I've experienced. Um, all right. So should I, I'm just going to keep on trucking here. Let's see, we were talking about data preparation. Yeah, I think that's what I was, number three. Um, so I think, you know, if you're not spending time on, you know, interaction and animation and bells and whistles, right, then, then what is the work of visualization? Like, what do you spend most of the time doing? And I think perhaps, uh, maybe this is disappointing to some, but I think most of it is really data manipulation, right? It's, uh, it's finding your data, it's cleaning it, it's transforming it, it's modeling it, it's, uh, you know, D3 group and D3 roll up, all that sort of stuff, joining data together. Um, I think in a some sense, like 
the answer to your visualization often exists in the data structure. And then the visualization is, you know, is just a more direct mapping of that data structure, meaning that most of the work of visualization is getting the data into the right structure first. It's not often just choosing the encodings or the, the, the technical work of constructing that visualization. So I think I'm, you know, I think that the part of D3 that I reach for most often, I'm almost positive is D3 array, right? That's the, that's the low level tools for, for doing data manipulation um, and D3 group, D3 group and D3 rollup, which are the, the sort of latest additions to that, which I'm really excited about. Um, but I'm also excited about sort of some of the complementary work that's happening in JavaScript these days, um, such as our Caro um, from Jeff Hare and UW IDL, um, which is built on top of, or, or at least it's compatible with Apache Arrow, um, and other sort of like tidy JS um, and other projects that are that are happening that sort of help people transform their data more quickly. Um, so related to this, I think the fourth point is, uh, you know, you often can't tell whether a visualization is going to be effective um, for you for the questions that you're trying to answer until you've put your data into it. All right. So remember, we talked about sort of some of the dangers of examples earlier. I think one of the dangers there is you get really excited about an example. You think, you know, that's going to be the one that I want. Um, in a sense, you commit to it prematurely before you've put your data into it and before you've actually able to see whether that visualization is appropriate, right? Because I think you can't really answer the question until you see your own data into it. Does, does that visualization surface the trend or the pattern um, that you were expecting or that you weren't expecting? Or is it just kind of, you know, the, the null hypothesis equivalent of a visualization and doesn't really show you anything? Um, so I think, you know, that's influenced the design of observable as well. We want to try to make it as fast as possible for you to take one of these examples and just replace the data set uh, and see how it works. You know, you don't even need an account. You don't need to fork it. You can just hit the, the replace button on the file there. Um, but of course, that's dependent on you getting the data into the same structure. And so we want to make that part of it easier as well, because if your data doesn't happen to be in the in the same exact structure as the example, which is probably true 99% of the time, you know, it's still going to be a bunch of work for you to do that. And whatever we can do to make that easier, I think, is beneficial. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so fifth point here, and we touched on this a little bit, but I think visualization, you know, it's not all the same, right? There's different types of visualization. And I think of it as living on this continuum from, you know, exploratory to explanatory, excuse me. Um, right, so an exploratory visualization, I think of it as something that you're making really for yourself. You wanna understand what's going on in your data. You're developing some insight in your own mind versus an explanatory visualization, which is, you know, you already understand something and now you're trying to communicate that to someone else. You know, that could be your coworker, that could be your boss, that could be, you know, the, the broader world at large that is interested in, in whatever you're, you're analyzing. Um, and of course, there's a spectrum there as well, where you can have things that are in between, like you can have a visualization that is explanatory, where there's some like top level insight that you're trying to communicate, but it may also incorporate some exploratory aspects where people can kind of personalize it, right? Like they can see themselves in the data or they can ask sort of more specific questions. Um, and there can also be, you know, exploratory um, you know, applications that you might build within your company, right? When you when you design a dashboard, for example, you know, there can be some exploratory functions to that as well. And so that's incorporating some of your own opinions as to what's important, what you're trying to communicate, but also giving some sort of constrained ways that a reader can answer their own questions um, and sort of tweak some of aspects of it in a more limited way. Um, so I think, you know, as you're designing a visualization, think about sort of where you are on the spectrum and what you're trying to do. Uh, and in particular, if you're trying to do something that's explanatory, I think that the bar is in a sense higher because you have to be explicit about what you're trying to communicate. Um, you know, you can't, you don't just stop when the visualization looks good, right? Like when it's pretty, um, you want to actually make sure that you understand something. I found it particularly useful, you know, working for the New York Times, how important the annotation layer was and you know if you couldn't think of what to say right if you couldn't think of what annotations you wanted to add or what title you wanted to put on the chart then clearly you know it wasn't ready to publish yet because you had to be able to put to words 
at least a handful of insights that you were trying to communicate with that visualization. It, it couldn't just sort of superficially appear like it, it was an interesting visualization. You actually had to be able to put it to words. Okay, so point six, and this is a little random jumping here, but I think, um, you know, 10% of code causes 90% of bugs. <laughs> I think we, you maybe want to believe that sort of all code is equally likely to contribute bugs, or maybe there's like sort of good code and bad code, and some people are more likely to write buggy code, but that's not how it works at all. Um, I think that there's just some code that is sort of inherently more likely to have bugs in it and therefore require more support. Um, for D3, that turned out to be um, the interactive behaviors. So things like D3 zoom, uh, D3 drag, and D3 brush, I think easily those were the hardest um, to support and maintain and the most frequent sources of bugs. And if you think about it, I think it makes sense because, you know, those interaction is, is complicated. You're talking about sort of asynchronous events, um, these state machines, um, where, you know, the, the permutations of things that can happen is very large. It's not like a date formatter where it's very sort of predictable. You give this input in, you expect this output out. Um, you know, when you're talking about sort of arbitrary sequences of events, um, unexpected things can happen. And that's true even of the standards and technologies that those behaviors are built on top of, right? So browsers struggle with it as well. And you've seen sort of the, the standards evolve over time, right? Where we have the introduction of pointer events and we have the, you know, well, a long time ago, but the introduction of touch events, right? So we've moved from different ways of interfacing with computers. And sometimes you get those in sort of unexpected combinations, right? You have a device which supports both pointers like a mouse, um, or devices like a mouse and touch events simultaneously. So what do you do? And you also have other ambiguities where it's like you're trying to click on something, but maybe you're trying to click and drag to select text, or maybe you're going to double click, or you maybe we want to brush and zoom at the same time. And all of those things make it tricky. So I think, you know, that also speaks to what we were talking about earlier of this sort of the, the challenge and the burden of implementing interaction. So as soon as you start to add that functionality to your visualization, um, it's, it can be a significant burden, even when you're using tools like D3 that, that try to make it easier for you. Okay, so point seven um, is in this kind of like the, the documentation point, but I think, you know, if you're building tools for other, for other people, um, support is a really powerful means of user research. And by that, I mean, you know, like when you do support, like when you answer people's questions on Stack Overflow or when you answer them on Twitter or when you answer them in the, the Google group or something like that, you know, you're not doing that in a sense like strictly for altruistic reasons. I think as the tool builder, you get a benefit from that as well, which is that you learn what people struggle with and you learn how they think about a particular problem. And I think if you can better, you know, understand how other people approach these problems, you know, you can communicate with them more effectively and you can build tools that sort of match their expectations more effectively. So there's, there's a huge benefit for you as a tool builder to really be involved with the people that are using your tools because it'll help you build a better tool. And that's just a very, I think, simple conclusion, but one that is maybe not um, embraced universally or, or could be could be sort of more widely adopted i guess uh, anyway it's one of the lessons that i've learned um the flip side of that though i think is that you also need to be careful as the tool builder that you know you can't solve everybody's problems um, it doesn't scale and i think you know sometimes there's this feeling that you know you want everybody to have a good time you want everybody to be happy you want them to all be successful using your tool and so there's a feeling that you need to sort of be there for everybody answering all of their questions. Um, and I think sometimes you just have to admit to yourself that, that you can't scale as an individual. You can't make sure that everyone has a good time. Some people are going to struggle and that's just, you know, the nature of the beast, I guess. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, you still want to be involved there and, and try to look for patterns, look for ways that you can make your support scale. So not necessarily helping each answer each individual question, but you know, when you see the same question being asked again and again, thinking about how you can turn that into a tutorial or how you can change the design of your tool to sort of um, prevent those problems before they happen. Um, now related to this point number eight, um, if you're sharing your work publicly, the internet will make you feel bad. Um, this is true. <laughs> 
This is true for me. I'm sure it's true for everyone else as well. And so I think it's no matter how good your work is in some sense or like how successful you are, uh, the internet is a terrible place. Um, and I say that somewhat facetiously, but like, you, you know, <clears throat> it can be, it can be a challenge. And I think I, I've also, I haven't shared this part, but I, and, and don't please, <laughs> Don't judge me again. This is how this is how I deal with it. But I, I maintain a collection of mean tweets uh, that people have shared about D3. I'm not sharing them with anyone else. Um, it's just kind of how I process it. Um, and sometimes like it, it actually does turn into a good thing. So, you know, I think one of the weird things about social media, people have always been frustrated. You know, people have a bad experience trying to use a tool or, or you know, going to a restaurant or whatever. Uh, the difference with social media is that now everybody gets to hear it, right? Including the the creators of that tool and that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I certainly don't judge anybody for being frustrated. I know that there are flaws in my tools and weaknesses in my documentation and that I can always do better. Um, but there is also, you know, an emotional cost, if I'm being honest, of hearing everybody's frustration. You know, I think that's kind of the new thing that social media provides is that now, you know, the tool maker gets to hear every instance of people being frustrated and it, it doesn't really get shared, you know, uniformly, um, you know, because I think if you are really frustrated, you want to vent somewhere and you can just go to social media. If you're just having kind of an averagely good time, you know, you probably don't feel like it's worth tweeting about. So they're not representative of people's experience. Certainly people do tweet positive things as well. And that feels great. Um, but I think also, you know, as a human, those bad experiences tend to have a disproportionate impact on you as well. Like those are the things that you remember. Like I can remember the bad tweets more than I can remember the good ones. And, and I wish I could remember the good ones. I mean, I remember some of the good ones as well, but you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. And I think no matter how thick of a skin you have, that's the effect. So, you know, I would ask, you know, if you do get frustrated with a tool or with, with not, not with D3, but with anything that you see out there, you know, try to think about what the practical impact is of your words. Um, you know, if you need to ask for help, absolutely ask for help, you know, and if something is, you know, uh, you know, reprehensible, absolutely <laughs> go ahead and, and, and call that out. But I think, you know, if, if it's just going to contribute to burnout and frustration and, and you're just kind of discouraging somebody from working on their tool, then, you know, maybe think twice about that. Maybe share that with your friends. You know, or maybe think about how you can contribute to the project rather than just complaining about it. Because I think, you know, that the problem of burnout in open source is real. And um, I, I absolutely want, uh, you know, open source to continue to be successful and D3 to continue to be successful. And I think you have to look at sort of what people get out of it. And a lot of what I get out of it is this feeling that I'm helping other people, you know, be productive, to understand their data um, to, you know, have a positive impact in the world. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it dilutes that sometimes when I just, I hear the negativity and, and the frustration as well. Um, okay. So, you know, if, if the internet is bad, I think the flip side of that is like that the number nine point is don't go it alone, right? There is value in a community, but I think it's, it's better to have sort of a, stable community, sort of a closer community than just sort of the, the internet at large. Um, and so I think it's really important, um, you know, particularly if you're just starting out um, and if you want to get better is to try to find a team, you know, a community that you can work together with and um, that can provide some external validation, that can provide feedback, you know, mentoring, um, just creative ideas, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and again, that's part of what we're trying to do with Observable is to, to bring this community of practitioners together um, so that they can share techniques, um, they can learn from each other, um, and they can sort of form kind of a tighter bond than just the, the broader internet at, at large, I guess. Um, now, okay, the last point, you know, I think I've talked for probably a lot more than 10 minutes now. <laughs> um, I was originally going to say, you know, take it easy. Um, but I think that's kind of a little bit disingenuous coming from me because I'm probably the last person to take it easy. Um, you know, I wish I could take it easy. So in some ways, this is like, you know, advice that I want to give to myself that I don't necessarily listen to. Um, but maybe I would say it as like, try to have a good time. Um, and I feel a little bit like a life coach now, you know, or like a celebrity giving you advice. <laughs> 
like that you don't really you, you don't need this advice from me anyway i'm just sharing it this is what this is something that i think about and obviously you don't have to listen to it but um <clears throat> i think if you understand sort of what parts of your work and your life that you enjoy you know and you spend more time doing that you know it's a good idea you're more likely to be successful um i think it's it's still very important or it can be very useful and valuable to have, you know, some ambitious goals to give you some structure and something to strive for. But I think you have to make sure that you enjoy the journey, right? That you, that you live in the moment um, and that you like sort of your day-to-day -day experience uh, as well. Um, and I, that sounds, I don't know if that sounds easy, maybe it sounds trite, but it, um, I think it is hard to do in practice. It's really easy to kind of get sucked into what, whatever your long-term objectives are and forget that you're not actually enjoying the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but I think if you are able to do that, you know, it's a good idea. Um, I think for one thing, you know, you'll have fewer regrets if you do fail because you, you know, you had a good time along the way and you got something out of it. It wasn't just that you were solely focused on the outcome of this goal, that you actually, you know, lived each day and you enjoyed it. Um, but paradoxically, I think you can also be more likely to succeed because one of the natures, uh, or one of the aspects of having these long-term goals um, is that, you know, they're hard and there'll be times where you struggle and you want to give up. Um, and I think if you enjoy the day-to-day, -day, you're more likely to succeed because you can persevere, right? You're willing to overcome those bumps in the road because you're not just focused on that, that goal at the end. You, you actually enjoy being in the moment and you're able to sort of keep trucking. Um, so for me, you know, as I've said, I really love, you know, this feeling of making tools that people love to use and seeing the impact of that on the world. Um, but I also, you know, kind of selfishly love building tools, right? Like just for their own sake and developing abstractions and solving puzzles um, and that sort of thing. So I think if you're, you know, disappointed that I'm not out there giving more to giving more talks and that sort of thing, I hope that um, <laughs> hopefully it's because I'm heads down, you know, building something new and that sort of thing. So thank you all for listening to my rambling talk. Uh, and I'm very excited to see, to just be here and, and to celebrate D3. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, thanks for braving the cold and the technical difficulties as well <laughs> <laughs> to share your, your There's wisdom. And them, yeah. Um, yeah, the chat is blowing up with thank yous and, uh, you might receive some nice tweets soon. Uh, I was looking at um, what people were saying. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks again for sharing. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been awesome. I know that I've got, I'm, I've got my space blanket, so I can <laughs> nice. Yeah, on. warm up, <laughs> uh, relax. You you deserve it for sure. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean your your message about like finding the work you, you want to do really resonates. Um, cause I, and it's because of D3 that I, I feel like I get to do the work that uh, makes me feel good and express myself. So just another, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. All right. Um, so next up, we have one more talk from, I'll uh, hide you for now. Um, we have uh, two of our community leads. Let me bring them up. There's Shirley and Seamont are going to join here to, to tell us about um, an exciting uh, project event thing that we're, um, we're putting on for the next little while. All right, Shirley, you're with us. Hello. Hey. And then Simon? I'm trying to get, okay, Simon should be connecting. D, D, uh, Phil says the D3 bar is open. Um. <laughs> I already finished my coffee. I know, me too, I'm like. <laughs> I, was like I was gonna get up to get more water and then Mike came on and I was like, oh, I can't, I can't miss any of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm gonna, after we're done, I'll make some coffee and tweet some nice things with everybody. I think that's a good good plan. Ooh, ah, yes. Hello. Oh, there we are. All right. <laughs> well, I will leave Hi. you to it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ian. Ian. Oh, man. Hi, Shirley. Hi, Juan. 
what long a time, time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's been so long since Monday. Um, since Monday. <laughs> but, I was um, going to say. Hmm? Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to. I know. I was going to say, uh, I don't think we have a talk, but like what a series of like, I'm just, I just feel so knowledged after Mike's 10 lessons. <laughs> Those were 10 key lessons for sure. I and like, know. you know, as I was looking through the list, like I know a lot of people have said this, hi, Karen. Um, a lot of people have said this, but like I'm looking at like 10 years of like heroes, you know what I mean? Like people I've looked up to for a decade um, mm -hmm. in, in this field. And, and like D3, is, I mean, D3 has changed my life. I don't know about you, Shirley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot of people in the chat that's like D3 gave me a like, like how I switched careers because of D3 or I have my current work because of D3. Yeah. It's really amazing. And like um, to kind of think about something that has such staying power, especially in um, the um, web environment where things just come and go in like four or five years. Like this, I know. And here we are a decade later. It's I know. <laughs> Seema, if we don't stop ourselves, we're just going to chat to each other. <laughs> like that's... <laughs> <laughs> this is true. We should we should probably we should, we should probably do the, the thing. That, we should probably do the thing that we're here to do, unless people just want to hear us chat. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Let me. Um, <laughs> Sorry, what, are we just... well, what are we? What are we actually chatting about? We're here to talk about. Yeah. So should we get started announcing this, Sima? Let's talk about the D3 parade. Yay! <laughs> okay, so um oh man, I should have prepared some like background music or like a like a drum roll. Um, I know you're okay. like a professional <laughs> Twitch person. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you should you should see my chat on my Twitch. Um people are just trying to help me out with Twitch because I don't understand how to use it. Anyways, okay, so let's get <laughs> on topic. Um, so, uh, what we want to announce today, Sima and I have been working on, along with everybody else in the communities, is a D3 parade! Yay! <laughs> and so, when we were when we gathered together to talk about like what is another way we can um, kind of celebrate a decade of D3, and we were like, why not um, celebrate ten years of D3 by creating data visualizations using D3 about D3 um, <laughs> because we're corny and cheesy like that. Um, and one of the, there was, there was a few things that were really important to us, right, Sima? Um, one of the things being kind of what Mike mentioned before about um, just having fun um, and making this like just a really fun experience. Um, yeah. And so uh, I think one of the uh, top things that we wanted to do was we wanted it to be kind of like a celebration of the amazing D3 community and all of the work that uh, people do um, kind of in the style of the show and tell that we used to have at our Bay Area D3 meetups. And so one of the first key things is that we will have, um, uh, we'll start the parade um, today, and um, we will kind of accept submissions of projects until a month from now, March 17th. And from March 17th to April 16th, in that one month period, we're going to be um, showing all of the contest entries, um, all of the, the submissions that um, people have given us so that we can kind of like show and tell all of our communities like um, visualizations, uh, and then um, the second thing we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of like recognize and give out prizes to um, the visualizations that we we as a community thought were really cool. But we didn't want to do it in kind of like that competition style of like, oh, this is the best or like, you know, mm -hmm. we don't I think us as a community, as a D3 community, we've we've never really been about being better <laughs> then one other. Um, I remember one of the first times um, I went to a D3 meetup, Ian and Kai were all about like, hey, D3 is already pretty hard to learn. So let's not make it any harder. And like, let's make it a very welcoming community. And let's celebrate each other's like, you know, passions and work. So um, on April 16th, we're going to have, uh, I think we're calling it a parade, a recognition ceremony. And uh, we've, instead of being like, you know, best 
the best visualization, we come up with like a bunch of really fun categories to celebrate. Um, but before we get onto that, um, CMOD's going to tell us about kind of like the data sets we have and the rules for the non-competition contest <laughs> recognition. <laughs> the non-competition competition. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Shirley. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things that I loved about about the D three meetups when I joined nine years ago was was this um, this vibe around each of the meetups to just celebrate everybody's work, um, and that and that's uh, and that's exactly what inspired me to start the D three Oakland meetup because I wanted that vibe in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, so the the that giants was, that of was the D three community and... were just they. That, Go ahead, Shirley. Uh, oh no, no no sorry I was just going to say your Oakland meetups were amazing like just every month i think that really contributed to our community so much sorry for interrupting thank you that's kind of you. i think it was it was the fact that we had awesome awesome d3 d3 people showing up every month <laughs> um <laughs> so to celebrate like when we like Shirley said when we wanted to to celebrate this this 10-year anniversary um we wanted to to use d3 to, to celebrate d3 um and so we prepared three data sources or three data sets. Actually, Ian did most of the work on this, I think, um, to prepare these D3 sources. Um, you can look at blocks.org, um, which for many, many years was was the canonical place for people to go and, and submit their, their examples and share their share their work. Um, and Ian and others, obviously, we, we heard about the crowdsourcing earlier, or the, the crowdsourcing campaign to start Block Builder. Um, and kind of build this build off of that community. Um, so they've kindly made these data sets available and you can see 10 years worth of, of D3 visualizations on there. Um, you can also, because this is cool, this is going right into the heart of D3, you can look at the D3 Git history and, and the Git commits um, for all the various D3 projects. That would be a pretty cool thing to visualize, pretty cool stuff to visualize actually. Um, and then finally, we also have a, a, a a data set of the NPM daily downloads. And there you can see an example of that. I mean, that's just incredible to see. Um, so these data sets are pre-cleaned and they're available immediately for download and you can get visualizing like, well, not right now, stay with us for a few more minutes. But, you know, <laughs> basically, once once this once this particular event is over, you can get started. Um, now, you know, in the spirit of D3, you don't obviously have to stick to, to those data sets. You can, you can you know, figure out your own data sets. Um, we've, we've offered some links to get you started. So um, there's a thriving community on, on Stack Overflow that, that's been answering questions, D3 questions for many, many years. Um, and I believe the archive and the, uh, the, the tag, the archive of the tag gives, gives a, a bunch of data there. Um, there's obviously the Twitter posts, uh, both um, the ones from the at d3js.org, uh, at d3js un uh, underscore org, um, official Twitter account and the the hashtag D3JS um, that's on Twitter will give you a wealth of tweets. Um, one of the one of the hashtags we actually love on Twitter, which is this may be a little controversial, but there's a lot of us who love it, um, which is the <laughs> hashtag D3 broke and made art. And there is actually some really really cool stuff, um, like D3 breaks in beautiful ways. And um, this ha this hashtag kind of celebrates those, those beautiful ways. Um, I would love to see a visualization, visualization to celebrate that personally. Um, there are, and then, of course, the, the other ways that the community interacts are through the Google group and the meetup groups. And so, you know, we've linked through to both of those where in the, in the Google group, you can see um, a list of, of all the messages uh, that have been going on for, God, I don't even know how long, um, but since probably before 10 years. Um, and then the, the D3 meetup uh, groups that are there. I, I remember when we looked um, a couple of weeks ago, Shirley, there was like, was it 38 meetup groups or something like that? Yeah, well, um, not all of them are strictly D3, but there's, you can you can kind of like go through and clean. Um, there's some that are data viz, some that are D3 specific, but according to meetup, when you search for D3, 39 groups and 43,000 members. Right. Which is a lot, a lot to visualize. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, just, just to get very serious for a second, uh, we do have a, a, some rules. We're trying to keep that uh, a very small group of rules. Um, our first rule is, of course, uh, use D three to make these visualizations. <laughs> so you know, as good as your Tableau viz might be, it's, it's it won't belong in a D three parade. Um, 
And we'd ask that you submit your own work. And what that also means is that if you have any graphics or other things that you're adding to, to your project, uh, please make sure that the that the copyright restrictions or the copyright or you have the rights and the licensing to, to share that widely. Um, we we prefer open source, um, so there you go. And then finally, you know, this is one of those those non contest contests where you can submit as many projects as you want. So as long as you fill out a form for each project, you can you can go ahead and and submit that project. Um, and I'll walk you through the form later, but first. Um, I think Shirley wants wants to tell us about what y'all can win. Yeah, definitely. And actually, this is something that uh, we didn't uh, think to talk about uh, when we were preparing for this. But actually, another thing that um, what Mike was saying made me think about, and also kind of the celebration of community, which is that uh, we should also encourage like groups or teams or collaborations to do oh, projects yeah. together. Um, this is kind of like hearing Ian talk about it, hearing Christoph talk about our community. I think uh, if you want to like use this opportunity to like form a small team together and, um, you know, do a whole project together, um, I think that would be a fun thing also. We can add that to mm -hmm. like the rules of you can, you know, because it's not a competition or a contest. So like, right. you can do whatever <laughs> you want as long as you follow the rules. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to be like kind of a fun thing. So instead of like a best of, we tried to kind of brainstorm what would be fun categories uh, for recognition. And so we came up with some things like most interesting color palette, creative use of a single color, um, accessible, like kind of uh, good accessibility. Uh, ooh, I like this one a lot. Most vintage version of D3 used. <laughs> I love that one. I want to see D3V1 represented up there. Yeah, I don't even know like what that would be like. But yeah, most and I love that it's the vintage version. Um, most creative way to show time, best animation, most unique layout, best titles, legends, and annotations, um, most interesting interactions. Um, but of course, these are just things that we've brainstormed together. And uh, you know, it's just the three, like two or three of us in the um but uh, we would love um, in the spirit of community to see like if you don't see a category that excites you, we would love to hear from you instead about a category that you think would be really interesting. And of course, uh, you know, what's a celebration without some prizes? So uh, we have, um, we're still finalizing the prizes for you, but the tentative list is that we have five membership subscriptions to Front End Masters, sponsored by Front End Masters, and that's really exciting because they are a online um, platform for uh, courses that are all um, front end related. So there's some really amazing courses on there that's like anything from like basic JavaScript to, um, well, there are some really great uh, courses on animations. <laughs> Um, there's also a series of courses on uh, D3 uh, that I've I've done, um, and so yeah, it's a really great resource. Um, oops, as well as um, a set of data visualization books sponsored by Observable. So the idea is that um, the tentative idea is that we kind of you know link these books to different. Um, uh, categories and um, depending on the category that you're recognized for, we have like a um, a book tailored to that category. So here's some of the tentative ones, and of course, like we want to add many more books to this list. And this is definitely not, you know, like all of the books that are amazing for D3 and data visualization. So again, if you have a book that you would like to win, please suggest it to us. Yeah. Um, I I want to win data, data sketches personally. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and so I guess just to reiterate, when the contest is um, starting today and up to March seventeenth is the open period for for accepting all the submissions. Um, so get started. Well, not again, not right now, but you know, today <laughs> would be great. Um, and then we'll take the next month to kind of show off all the all the all these submissions and um, invite our celebrity judges to uh, to come and help us you know pick some of their favorites um, and we'll we'll culminate that all on on the 16th of April 
which is the day after tax day. So don't worry, it's be, it'll be a nice way to lay back. Um, and we'll do our virtual recognition ceremony and, and kind of um, announce the awards. Um, and so how do you enter your submission? Well, you want to go to that URL on the, the d3.community. Um, and I think we'll we'll probably just paste it in the chat as well. Um, but if you head on over there and and to this page, you'll see a form all the way at the bottom when you scroll down. Um, after you go past all the all the things that Shirley and I have already told you about, um, and the form is it should be pretty straightforward. We we want your name, we want your email address, um, and we we want to know a little bit about your your visualization, a, a URL uh, to it, and if you want to tag it with. Um, some of the categories, you know, that we, the recognition categories, feel free to do that. If you'd like to suggest a category, this would be a great place to do that. You just tap the the other button or the other checkbox and, and fill in your category name there. Um, and then we're curious as to what award you'd like to win. And and once again, um, to suggest an award, you can use that form right there and just click the uh, the other radio button and um, and put in the, the name of the book that you'd want to that you want to see uh, yourself win. Um, and that's pretty much it, you know, um, you, you want to do this once for each of the visualizations that you're going to be submitting for the, for the parade. Um, and as far as protoviz, we'll have to go get back to the judges. Um, we'll, so we'll get back to you on whether we'll allow protoviz visual, visualizations <laughs> well, or not. I think, I think what would be, I think what we should say is that it, it must use D3, but you can use other things, uh, in, um, in addition to D3 also. So you could you could do Protoviz and D3. And then would that be the most vintage version of D3 use, <laughs> okay, if they use Protoviz? <laughs> Protoviz and yeah. D3 V1. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That would be so vintage. Um, <laughs> D3 to re-implement Protoviz. Um, and then uh, I love some of the category and book suggestions um, that are coming in. Please, uh, you know, like make sure to submit it. I guess um in which case like what if they just submit the category suggestions without the project or like do they have to make a project to earn the er, the honor Ooh. of suggesting a category? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um well while that is preferred, I mean you should you should feel free to, to let um Ian, Shirley or I know. Um, you know, either in the chat or Twitter or email or find us in some way. Um and we'll 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 take that into advisement and, and put it on the list. Did I just say take that into advisement? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll think about we'll think about your suggestions. We'll we'll consider them very carefully. Yeah, it's definitely a community effort. Um, ooh, code that uses D three V two. But yeah, so I think uh, that is the the parade uh, D three visualization um, with data around D three and the community uh, using D three. Thank you, Shirley. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Great to see you too. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> thank um, you, Ian. Yeah. Can you guys? Can y'all stick around for just a second because oh. um, we're gonna do. Uh, we're not gonna move on to the Q and A section, and maybe people have questions for y'all. Um, but yeah, this is exciting. I'm really, really excited to see what people make. I think, you know, if there's anyone better to visualize in the history of their community, uh, it's this, this group, right? Uh, I heard that Mike, um, Mike's parents took his computer, their computer back. So, <laughs> you know, parents going to parent. What, yeah. what a uh, story. <laughs> Yeah, so you can't join us. Uh, you you got to go back home and take care of stuff. Um, oh. So we'll have to pass on any questions from Mike in particular uh, later. But uh, we will have some of the, um, you know, we have our leads here. I'm going to invite Curran up. I don't know. I didn't check with, like, Curran or Phil if they're actually, like, ready for this. So <laughs> we're just going to see, see what happens. Do me alive. Uh, Doing we got a a little bit um a little bit of time left in this uh you know in our in our meeting here and we can can talk about all things D3 and community. So okay, I see some questions popping up. Uh let me well before we get to that, I'm gonna invite some more people. 
I don't know what the limit is. Um, but we'll find out. Hey, Curran. Made it. Hey, Curran. Oh, I see. I see Christoph. Hi, Christoph. All right. Let's take a look at some of these questions to see. Um, I mean, maybe the, the one I see is the, uh, are there any ways, are there ways to interact with the D3JS community other than signing up for the newsletter or launching Slack? Start answering that one. Because I don't, I'm not sure that we actually have a perfect answer yet, but it's one of the questions that I know I'm like, this is not the only person that's interested in. Well, Ian, you had an, a nice index of places to look. Where was that? Oh, right. Yeah. So I, I have started collecting like a list of all of the places you can chat with people. I haven't published it. I was hoping that we could do that soon. Um, and, and like use that as a way to uh, figure out what to either invest in or bridge, right? Like there's all these different um, ways we could handle that. So it's still a still a non-answer for me. <laughs> well, I, I have something to share if I could. Okay. Yeah, please do. I, I compiled a list of sorts. There's the D3 Slack, which is like the main thing. I would suggest that group. It's amazing. There's the D3 Zulip, which is brand new. We're sort of testing the waters. There's the Data Visualization Society Slack, which is a, a broader community. But there are a lot of great D3 folks in there. There's the Observable Forum. There's the D3 mailing list. And there's Stack Overflow questions. And D3 GitHub issues is actually a place where a lot of discussions happen. So those are some things that come to mind. Nice. Um, yeah, no, that, that list is, is really helpful. Seems pretty so, comprehensive. Yeah. Yeah, we will post some things soon. Um, but I think there are various channels that, as a community, we are trying to better like uh, uh, identify for what they could be used. Uh, uh, for example, if it's for collaborating, like it needs to be more live. If it's for like uh, uh, asking help, of course we have Stack Overflow, we have a Google Groups. If it's for a a request, and um, so that's why I, I still think that Slack is the place where people come when they want to have kind of an interaction. Um, but the website will we try to have like on the main page uh, what we decide, and because we we also have an email, like we have like tons of these channels. Um, so yeah, like let's try to decide which one to use when, and and like which one to use when we want to have an interaction. I know that there's a Mastodon channel for database too, so like it's very split. But at the same time, I like that it's. It's kind of like we have rooms for naturally kind of getting together with different platforms. Um, so, so yeah, let's just like jump on one of these that we will suggest on the front page of the website. Nice. Um, and a sort of, I see another question here which is, oh, I'm going to start this one. So how do you all think about navigating the corpus of community contributions from a discovery standpoint? In other words, have there been discussions around different approaches to navigating the community contributions in a more visual and exploratory manner, maybe like Elijah Meek's hierarchical bubble chart, the D3 API that comes to mind, which Amelia Wattenberger also did a really cool um, iteration on that. Um, or something more like turn by turn directions, like of search results. So I have to say that um, when Block Builder uh, was alive <laughs> um, and Block Builder search um, was in full swing, that was actually how I discovered examples. So um, I guess the, the process I usually use when I was trying to go to like a new part of the D3 library, because like you mentioned earlier, how many modules are there? Like 
I can't even like having used D3 for what eight years, I still don't know everything like in the library. Um, so what I tend to do is first I look at the docs and I read the docs and then I look at the examples that are linked from the docs. And then if I'm still confused, what I used to do is go to Block Builder Search and I'll search for that module. Um, and then it will return all of the blocks that uh, use that module. I am still uh, looking forward to that being re-implemented either in Observable or somewhere else. Please re-implement it because that was an amazing resource. Um, so I would say that that's, for me, the place um, to go. That's not alive anymore, but should be. <laughs> yeah, I can. I second that. Yeah. And I would want to give you like a timeline of this. Um, so when we wanted to go to the visually workshop, one of the first like huge D3 workshop and like there was no ticket left. So, so then we just went to a cafe and then started the barrier D3 meetup. And then this team uh, led the way to the D3 um, uh, uh, on Conf. And then at the D3 on Conf, we, we discussed, hey, we need that place where you, you can just type like the name of a module and then you will have like tons of uh, gifts or blocks. And then um, uh, Irene at uh, Bokut uh, uh, did it. And it's what's called Blog, Spl Blog Explorer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember that. And then that's a bit what became Block Builder like after like tr uh, uh, tributary, but, but then in Blocks Builder 2, there was like this way to search by, by module. And now there is like like 40,000 examples on that gallery. So back then I was like manually compiling like a list of like two, two, 2,000 stuff. And then like Jan like just like slammed me with like, okay, I have like 40,000, okay. Uh, but these examples are still there. And I think that we can also answer the question that, that Chris H um, mentioned, um, what about uh, uh, observable, because now when you are on the D3.js uh, front page, the examples will, will go there. So maybe Jan can talk a bit more uh, 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 about this, like why the, the transition from Block Builder to, to this. But what I want to emphasize is this gallery of 40,000 things are still there. They are searchable. Um, so that, that's huge. And, and this is just like gifts. So you have like multiple ways to, to find them. Uh, you have multiple like front end that you can put on top of it to find them. Like that's still a huge database. Yeah, um, I feel like I could say a couple of things here because I think that um, A, yeah, like the block builder evolution and the search, right? Like, it, it is just um, an index where, like we found a bunch of user, GitHub usernames of people who had made blocks over time. And then we use the GitHub API to download their JIT, their GISTs, GISTs, the gist of it, yeah. And then we like catalog, you know, parse them out for their code and, and catalog them by like, yeah, the D3 version or uh, what's in the readme and that kind of stuff. So all of that is like based on open, data, right? Like all those gists are public. Um, the gist behind the blocks are published. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mutari. It's pronounced GIF or GIF, either way. Um, so that's that's all there still. And like the, I shared a link to the block builder search like archive. So that's like the 40,000 blocks that we had indexed. We have indexed, we have them processed in various ways that was like being fed into Elasticsearch. What's happened is that basically like Block Builder, right? It was a Kickstarter, it, was open, it is open source. Um, the whole idea was to try to make it easier to edit blocks, right? Like a way to um, make it quicker to share and like tweak and, and do it in the browser. But like a lot of the things that we wanted to do, and you know, people asked for, I, I definitely wanted to make, just require way too much like effort, not like way too much of everything to do, right? Like it, you know, I was just doing it as like a, like after the first few months, it became like an open source thing that I was maintaining as a hot, like a side project. And like, you know, the features need like real engineering behind it. And like, 
the the search engine kept falling over. And I, I had sponsorship from Google at one point and from Elasticsearch themselves at one point. But like for whatever reason, like the index just keeps dropping and like I can't, you know, it was like every other week I'd have to go back and debug it. And so all of it is still open source. Like it's still if somebody wants to figure out a way to um, host the search engine, that's one thing. But I think that like a stepping back and what this question gets at and what we've been talking about is that like the navigation, the wayfinding, like helping people find what they're looking for is like the bigger challenge. And we have we have all the resources. We just like I think it's a big project. And it's gonna take multiple, you know, a team of people to tackle it to say like, hey, you know, here's how you like oh, you're trying to learn this, like look here, right? And that may be totally different if you're a React developer trying to bring in a visualization into your application, or you're like a journalist trying to like do some integrate some story and like scrolly telling or something, right? Like a totally different ways of thinking about uh, the same library. So, and there's examples in both cases, just like how do you find them? How do you even know what to ask for? So, um, you know, I think with like to touch on the observable part, right? Like a Observable has that team behind it. It has a, you know, a dedicated group of people trying to make it better to make um, programming in the browser a much better experience. The search is something that's you know actively being worked on, improving all the time. Um, and then you know the D three blocks that got ported to Observable. There's like 400 of those, right? And like keeping those all maintained, like having them like fixing bugs or updating when D 3s versions update. It's just a lot of work. Right, and nobody is just going to do that work in the in like outside of context. And observable just makes that easier work to do. So that being said, like like we, it's been mentioned, right? The, the the gists behind those examples still are out there. They're but they're just not going to be updated with the latest versions, right? And because it's just too much work to maintain parallel, like four hundred parallel things um, for the team. And that's, you know, it's just kind of the way it is. So, but like as our community group here, we can make an effort to say like, hey, you know, maybe it is worth it to like have some of the older stuff be like easier to find in, in context of some of the books, like I believe like Scott Murray is wonderful, like the inter introduction, interactive data viz, right? On the web, like that so many people have learned from, I don't think it's been updated to the latest version Right, so like the examples that match that book would be like super useful to be able to easily find, and that's a doable thing. It's something that like if we put our minds to it, we can make that happen. And, um, you know, yeah, I think we should. I want to say that uh, I was joking around earlier about you know block like RIP block builder and search and all of that, but I want to say I really really appreciate. Uh, your sharing with us like the oftentimes invisible work uh, and struggle of um, you know like keeping something up and running of uh, I remember you mentioning those struggles um, of block builder search and the reason why you eventually decided to um, deprecate it but I think it's so good for us um, in the community especially for someone like me that um, I'm not a tool builder I'm like a tool user so I feel like it's so good for someone like me that benefits from all of the tools that everybody builds to hear kind of like the the struggle that goes behind it too and hopefully that means that people um, hopefully that means people can, um, you know, rally around and help. And um, it's a really good point about uh, the fact that um, I think we touched on this multiple times in the stream of how open source work is really tough um, and takes a lot out of people that decide to do it. And, um, and then uh, how because of that, Observable is a really, like, it is a good place in that it's pushing these kind of... Um, tools along because it is a business. I think that's a really interesting and good point. But um, whether it's through observable or whether it's uh, through the community rallying behind, um, you know, this effort because of what you just shared, um, I hope 
uh, I just want to say thank you for sharing that. And I hope that means that um, people will volunteer or kind of like, you know, really push the effort along. Yeah. Let's see. I'm, I'm looking at uh, some of the other question. Um, well, someone asked about conferences and events. I think that, uh, let's switch gears to that just for a second. Um, we have a, uh, several prominent event hosts here. <laughs> so I would say outlier if it hadn't just happened, um, which was awesome. What is the full question, Ian? Uh, sorry, the full question was just like, oh yeah, are you are you looking forward to what conference events are you most looking forward to in the next year or two? I guess. Yeah, I feel like uh, I was just updating actually because I have like a article that I regularly update with like the upcoming Viz conferences, but things don't end up getting planned that far in the future often. So there's like often like one coming up in like a couple months kind of thing. Um, so like the only one that I know about, but people should correct me if I'm wrong, is like the only one that I know about that's planned is the next show in April. Um, and then there'll probably be, uh, the plan is for there to be another outlier next year, but that's a while away. So, <laughs> but like, I know there's other things that tend to repeat, right? Like data best to Blizzy tends to repeat and data is live. And I don't know if I'm missing things. I've been tracking a couple myself. I know that there's data.world summit coming up March 25th. I've never been, I don't know what that's like. CSV conf in May, May 4th and 5th. Um, ACM CHI, it's kind of academic, but I think there's some related stuff going on. The IO festival is in June. Um, the information- Oh, I hope that happens. Right, right, <laughs> me too, me too. That's one I'm very much looking forward to when it happens again. And of course, the epic um, IEEE Viz in October, where D3 was originally presented all those years ago. Nice. And and then I think, you know, we can look forward to more meetups and streams. I, I think I'm excited to see, uh, like, see us doing more things like this online um, for, the, for the near future and, and going forward. The Spanish D3 meetup is going to happen, uh, you know started existing today in the chat. So <laughs> that's really cool. Oh, and Zan just asked in the chat, so I'll respond about the outlier videos. They'll be out in a few weeks, uh, actively working on those. Um, so yeah, for the public soon. <laughs> uh, I knew that uh, you briefly touched on D3 and Observable earlier, but there is, I think, another quite good question about it. If anybody wants to answer the, I barely started learning D3 and don't really understand the relationship between D3 and Observable. Could someone explain this simply? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, to give it a shot. So, I mean, D3 as a uh, open source JavaScript library, right, is a set of tools you can use um, anywhere you can use JavaScript that helps you uh, work with data, turn it into <laughs> browser, um, you know, elements, visualizations, and but it has a lot of other stuff like data processing. And um, I, I tend to think of it like a, a big Swiss Army knife full of you know useful things, or even an entire workshop like woodworking, like with all the tools that you might pull down and use and then put back and use something else. Um, so that, you know, is a, it's foundational to so many, um, like the process of building a lot of visualizations and you use those tools um, and it touches, it, it's, it itself is like, utilizes other things kind of underneath it, like the browsers, HTML, DOM, right? Or um, JavaScript fun functionality or CSS and SVG, that kind of stuff. Whereas observable is like, it's kind of, I think of it right now kind of like a place you can go to do uh, JavaScript. I mean, it's not just for data visualization, right? Like you can, you build, you tend to build these notebooks, um, but it's, it's kind of like a workshop, like a, one of those maker spaces or something you would go to where all the tool, a lot of tools are there for you. Um, you don't have to like install a big, 
vent hood in your house and like make sure the laser cutter isn't suffocating you or whatever. Like it's just you go to that place and you, you can do um, really. This cool. analogy is amazing. <laughs> it is not. Uh, you know, it hasn't been run by the the team, so hopefully I'm not uh, <laughs> just kind of thinking of it right now. Uh, but you know, it is. It's a it's a a product that will you know kind of like you could think of like GitHub is to Git in a way, right? Like it's going to have features that make hopefully make your life easier. And if you want to think about data in the web, um, and you know, I I work there. I'm excited. I I like I do that. All the time, I use Observable to make data viz with D3 often, um, but it is you know they are separate, um, and and yeah so and you know some of the confusion has come from like coming to Observable to see D3 examples, um, and I think that like we on both like the D3 like where, what we've been talking about making better navigation, better um, wayfinding, so that you find the right example at the right time will um, help put that in context. And then, uh, yeah, Observable is constantly trying to, to do a better job of um, making it easier to understand and easier to use and um, adding more powerful features, of course. So so that's the way I see the, the difference, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big reflection we have in the community right now. So so I think it's a good time to join um, because I think it's it's about all the, the layers D3 is a very specific layer. You have like like an HTML5 thing and it works on your browser and you can ask it for like divs and spans. And then you have CSS where you can bring colors. So that, that's very like the, the low level. And then you have like a, a SVG and canvas, which is like the way to be able to draw, to draw with kind of a pencil or with kind of like vectors, like points and lines between them. And I still think that's what people should start by with. If if they are at that level, if they want to be a uh, developer, if they want to be to do something else than what a chart library can give. D3 is a set of helpers. It's not even a library. It's kind of an ecosystem of like tiny codes that 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 helps you. The core of it is to bind data to that. Like give me as many squares as I have things in in that uh, list. You know, that's all. And then like it will help you like compute scales and and then it will also give you some some building blocks uh, to have like part of bar charts and part of stuff. So that's more like a code pattern. And then you can use this to build charts and then you can have chart libraries in between. So you can have plugins like so uh, all of these are layers. And I feel that an observable notebook is like the kind of the topmost layer where I want to make some code and then I want to see the result and then I want to continue. And I, and I want to kind of have like an iterative way of working with it where each stages, each steps are still there. So I can have like an explanatory thing. And then it becomes something else than coding. It becomes like an explanation of something. So you can have some text and then instead of having an image, you have like an interactive thing. And then you can fork it and you can try it. So for me, it's all about these layers. And when people come to the D3 website right now, they are a bit confused about how do I learn it? Learning it with an observable notebook is a different learn path than learning it by copy pasting an example or by looking at an API doc. So that's a big reflection we have in the community. And we will try to continue this in the D3JS community website. And we will try to bring this to the D3JS.org website for better like uh, guiding to the right learning path. Um, I see in the chat too, like Phil and Chris have brought up VizHub. So Curran, do you want to maybe say a little bit? Because you've you put a lot, you know, a lot of people have put a lot of examples and um, shared work on on VizHub as well. And you know that I remember you contributed to the block builder um, code that that's shared with VizHub as well. So it would be appropriate to to mention. Sure. Yeah, VizHub is a thing I created um, really to solve my own need when I was teaching data visualization. 
uh, with this online course that I'm doing at Worcester Polytechnic Institute every fall. It's an online graduate course. And VizHub is the platform that I use to make the lecture videos, and it's the platform that the students use to do the assignments. And it was very much inspired by Block Builder. And I actually used Block Builder the first year, and then I, I really wanted to use ES6 modules to you know, s scale the code. And, and I still use VizHub. Um, the thing about it is it's it's vanilla JavaScript, and there's not any VizHub specific machinery that goes along with the examples. And I think people, you know, would benefit from seeing a bunch of examples like that as well, where you can see clearly the path from like, okay, there's the HTML file, and that's where that's the code that runs, and that's where the the SVG gets appended to the DOM. You know, all that stuff is laid bare, but in observable, there there are layers of observable specific stuff in there. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak about it. It's my passion project for a couple of years now. Uh, just a side project, really. Um, I have a full-time job, which is not visible. So. Ian, <laughs> Ian, you're muted. I swore I clicked that button. Um, <laughs> I was just saying that, yeah, thank you, Corinne. Um, and then um, some of the, uh, yeah. Okay, here's a question. What is, what's a crazy new feature you'd want to see in D3 version 12? <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, but, uh, you know, we might have to sleep on that. I think that um, we're kind of hitting the time of our, our we hit two hour mark. Uh, it's been an you know, amazing uh, celebration. Uh, I think you know, we have a lot to look forward to. One, I will address one more question here about will we do more online meetups, which the answer is yes. Uh, the parade, you know, shout out to the parade um, celebration on April 16th, right? Um, so that's definitely going to be one. We're going to start the new Spanish meetup some, uh, very soon. Uh, but we'll do more. We'll, we have the D3 online meetup, which would be a great place to, like, you know, stay, keep up with, uh, online events going forward. Um, so yeah, I want to thank uh, everyone, all the leads here. I want to thank Mike again for his amazing um, words of wisdom and, and inspiration uh, and for 10 years of D3, of course, right? Um, and I want to thank this community for, for being such an amazing community to be a part of. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, thank you, Ian. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Well, yeah. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Uh, we will share the recording uh, of the the talks. We'll make sure the chat is summarized and get all the, the good links out there. Um, and I hope people make fun uh, celebratory visualizations for the the parade. Sign up for the newsletter. Um, and we'll we'll see you online. Yeah. Thanks. Rock on everybody. Thanks for joining yeah, us again. Bye everybody.